Hello everyone, my name is Robert Winfrey and what you're about to listen to is an old episode of a podcast I used to host called Everyone Loves a Bad Guy. This particular episode was my uh, sort of return after the holidays at the end of 2014, and the original air date is January 23rd, 2015. And this kicked off a mini arc of sorts where I looked at actors known for villainous portrayals and some of their most iconic roles, some of their maybe lesser known roles that we got a kick out of. Uh, that was the idea behind this you know, kind of themed out series I was doing. Uh, this episode, I couldn't start this series without talking about anyone other than the tremendously talented Sir Christopher Lee. Again, this aired before his passing, uh, or right around it, because um, again, this was January 23rd, 15. So yeah, just a couple of months before his passing, actually. But this is myself and Pat Mullen, and we talk about, again, the greatness of Christopher Lee. Uh, the man's career spanned multiple, multiple decades. Uh, his turns as Dracula, the villainous uh, character in Star Wars, uh, Count Dooku, Saruman, of course, from the Lord of the Rings franchise. Um, we just heap praise upon the man because he's his body of work is tremendous, so... That's what you're in store for, an examination of some of his roles. Some you might know, some you might not. So give it a listen. It's Pat and I geeking out about one of our favorite actors. You know, what? Uh, that's all I can do to sell you on it. If you've listened this far, please like, comment, subscribe, uh, star rating, written review, whatever is applicable to your podcast platform of choice. If you've done any and all of that, share, let people know about the show, that you enjoyed it, that you enjoyed the network. I uh, deeply appreciate anything and everything you all can do in that regard, so... With that in mind, let me throw it back to 2015, myself and Pat talking about Christopher Lee. Hope you all enjoy the show. And thank you all so very much for joining us here. Uh, this is my personal podcast. I have been, I've had the show on hiatus since November, give or take, of uh, 2014. It's been a rough couple of months. Uh, stuff personally, over all the holidays, stuff. But show's back, show's ready to rock and roll. I want to thank you all so very much for still listening to this. For sticking with uh, me, the show, all of the support that you guys have shown me, I really do appreciate it. Uh, I, I mean, if it weren't for you guys, again, kind of being out there, knowing you're all listening, I probably might have just kept the show on hiatus. But I like it too much. You all like it. And I'm ready to rock and roll again. I'm I'm back. You know, I feel good. I feel really good. I feel ready to keep going. And we're kicking off a new chapter as far as Everyone Loves a Bad Guy goes. I've done themes before. I did several months devoted to comics. Uh, I did a series of television 
on television shows leading up to the Breaking Bad finale. I, I don't mind theming out several weeks. Well, we're starting one this week. We're going to be looking at actors who made their chops in villainous roles. Uh, there's a bunch of names that spring to my mind almost immediately thinking about this, and uh, we'll go through a bunch of them later. But uh, that's kind of where we're going. I want to focus several of them individually. I'll have a couple of shows that are just kind of hodgepodges as far as you know, maybe discussing three or four different guys who don't have necessarily the filmography to devote an entire show to. Elements of this I'm still sorting out, but that's the basic thought process moving forward. And tonight we are kicking this whole thing off with maybe the greatest of all time as far as actors playing villains go. We're talking about Sir Christopher Lee, knighted. The man's awesome. Uh, we're going to go into great detail about some of his roles, what makes him so great. But before I ramble on too much on my own, I need to bring out my co-host, my guest, the man who agreed to step up and do this with me. For what? Uh, sorry, Radlich and Broadcasting Network. MVP, pugilistic pontiff, the poor man who lives in New Jersey, and I say poor just because it's New Jersey. I, I can't help but feel bad for him. Uh, Patrick Mullen is back here with us tonight, everybody. Pat, welcome back. It's been far too long. It has. I am excited to be back. I'm excited the show is back. Uh, a, lot, a lot of awesome things happening at one time. It's a little bit overwhelming, but nonetheless, everybody loves a bad guy. Rock and roll's on, and I'm just happy to be along for the ride. Uh, when I first decided I was going to do this, I, am, for some, I'll tell you exactly why I thought of you. This leads into a minor pseudo apology I have to give to everyone out there. For longtime fans of the show, or if you've heard the selected episodes and just happen to have a very good memory, uh, Pat's been on here a few times. Uh, I'm always happy to have him. But he and I have covered some of this ground before. Uh, specifically, he was on when we talked about Dracula, and that's going to be a fair amount of what we talk about uh, for kind of the middle portion of the show because Christopher Lee is such a prolific version of Dracula. He was also on my two-parter on James Bond villains, and we spent some time talking about him there, and we'll be rehashing a bit of that here. So to anyone who's listened to those episodes, you're going to get a little bit of a rehash here, but we're going to be talking specifically about him uh, instead of kind of the generalities and that we did with some of the others. So I'm just going to issue a very brief apology there. But I thought about you because on the aforementioned Dracula podcast, you mentioned something, and for some reason it's kind of stuck in my head, that Christopher Lee as Dracula from the old Hammer movies caused uh, poor little Pat Mullen to stay awake at night clutching his rosary beads. And I don't mean to embarrass you or anything, but i it's impossible for me not to have thought of you when I decided I was going to do this. And I'm very grateful you were willing and able to step up and join me for this show. Oh, my my pleasure, and it's a compliment to the man we're about to talk about that he had that effect on me, and ultimately that's kind of what the goal of those roles are. So, you know, if I'm here saluting Christopher Lee, it's only proper that I do it the right way. All right. Uh, I, ca I want to talk a little bit uh, about kind of his background. I mean, Christopher Lee is into his 80s now. He actually served in World War II, for those of you who don't know that. I think he was stationed in uh, Sweden or Finland. I forget off the top of my head which one. One of those Nordic countries for a portion of that. Uh, but he had a he had a pretty good military career uh, fighting in World War II. He started acting because someone told him he was too tall for it, which is one of, he jokingly referred to this as one of those famous lines like, you know, you're too short to be a singer. Oh, I'm too tall to be an actor. Well, I'll show you. I mean, well, in all fairness, the man is six foot five. Uh, there's not too many actors with that kind of height. I think he and Vince Vaughn are like the two kind of famous actors who are well over six feet tall that consistently work when they want to. Uh, but he started out really kind of – he got his bones working in the kind of the low-budget Hammer Horror productions. Uh, I think the first one he appeared in for them, he appeared as uh, the creature, Frankenstein's monster, in one of their adaptations. I will find the specific adaptation here. But It's the Curse uh, of Frankenstein, I believe. Okay, yeah, probably. There were a lot of curses going around those ones. Uh, let me double-check that. And do, 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 do. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. All right, uh, but first of all, Pat, as far as that one goes, I mean, you cast a guy who's naturally 6'5 as the creature. It's got to make life easier for the director. You don't have to employ too many trick shots to make him look imposing. Yeah, you would you would think what an asset that would be that you have this, you know, especially in comparison to the height of the other people in the film, that 
this guy is so much taller than everybody involved that he's going to create that intimidating presence that is arguably for any actor the most important part of the creature because uh, you know when we look at the creature uh, and what the what the creature does and it's not something that's menacing with its words or it has a specific uh monstrous feature like a vampire or a werewolf it's largely the presence that is the most intimidating part and when you have somebody who's able to convey that and not just with their physical height but the way they can carry themselves in that role it's 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 going to give you a big boost and Obviously it did because the film wound up becoming a, a real unexpected high success and kind of kicked off the entire run of Hammer Studios' success from the late 50s into the mid-70s. Yeah, he played, uh, Christopher Lee did, he played a couple of different kind of the silent horror monsters. He actually played uh, The Mummy a couple of times as well. Uh, did a lot of stuff opposite uh, his actually very good friend, the late uh, Peter Cushing. Who, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with his body of work, uh, most famously, I think he's... Ah, uh, what the heck was that guy's name? Grand Moff Tarkin. Uh, Grand Moff Tarkin, thank you. Yeah, from uh, the first Star Wars movie. But those two had a lot of collaborations together. And uh, the thing, one of the things about what he was able to do in those movies, like Pat, like you just mentioned, it's, it's present. You know, it, it's not necessarily physical stature, it's carrying yourself it's it, this really kind of enigmatic odd thing that is just you know kind of screen presence or star power and not everyone has it it's something that is just, some guys have it some guys don't there's really no two ways about it and one of the things that as far as being the creature and i need to bring this up a little bit frankenstein's creature is a terribly difficult role to pull off as an actor and that, that doesn't sound i mean you think about it and it doesn't sound terribly difficult. I mean, you know, depending on how the creature's written, you lumber around, you look intimidating. But I defy you to name me any three great screen adaptations of the creature, with two exceptions. One being, again, Christopher Lee's, and the other is Boris Karloff, the original creature. I mean, when you consider the volume of movies that have adapted that story one way or another, and some of the quality of actors who have, ta who have taken on the creature... And it's so hard to do right. I mean, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein had Robert De Niro, of all people, taking on the role. And he just, I mean, there are plenty of other issues with that movie, but he doesn't have the same kind of presence. He doesn't have, you know, he, you don't really, he doesn't come across as the creature. Aaron Eckhart, God bless him, failed miserably in I, Frankenstein, although, again, plenty of other problems there. Not his fault, mind you. I'm not saying that was his fault, but... There's a lot of guys who have tried to be the creature and have not been able to do it successfully, and it speaks a lot to his talent that he can do that in one of those versions of the monster that is just, again, kind of the mute, lumbering uh, you know, monstrosity that we kind of got courtesy of, again, the Karloff version, which set the cinematic standard, even though the actual creature in the novelization, in the novel novelization is quite different. But, I mean... Name me one other guy who ta who was able to successfully tackle the creature and bring it to the big screen, and I'll be suitably impressed. Yeah, uh, you, you, you know, hit on the, the only I, two who I'm really did somebody? it. To, to me, you hit on the only two who ever accomplished it in Karloff and, and Lee. And again, pro, you know, Kar Karloff, obviously a prolific career in his own right. But Christopher Lee, we talk about that presence. And not just playing, you know, Frankenstein, but playing the mummy too, which actually was a, really a role where he had less – kind of, I'm trying to look for the right word, but he definitely had to emote with his face less he, cause, because he was his wrapped up in bandages. bandages. At least, yeah, yeah, at least as the like creature... My work is yeah, kind of at least as the creature, he had, he had his face, facial features exposed where he could, you know, make a certain motion with his eyes or, or glance a certain way. As the mummy, he couldn't do any of that, and yet... Being a consummate actor, he's able to use his body and understand the internal language that we all speak and don't always realize we are, and make the most of that too, which was even more difficult than the Frankenstein's monster role. And yet he did that with, you know, just, uh, and, and again, it's another role that, you know, is linked to Boris Karloff, like we talked about, but he took that and made it his own. And it's really to me, not a surprise that that mummy movie by Uni by Hammer, in many ways, is superior to the earlier Universal film and is considered as such by most critics. 
Yeah, I much prefer that version of the mummy too. So I I have a soft spot for, you know, the old universal mummy. I mean, I don't think there's a horror fan out there who doesn't. But something about the way they translated that story into Technicolor and again, you had the great tandem of Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. Uh, you had just so many great things that came out of that movie and some funny stories. Uh actually there's okay, brief history here. My actual introduction to Christopher Lee came courtesy of a VHS, a VHS, two VHS tapes that I got for Christmas one year. I believe one of my grandparents got it for me. It was uh, two uh, two parts of, I think it wound up being like a four-part uh, kind of documentary series called 100 Years of Horror that's hosted by Christopher Lee. And he shares a couple of stories from shooting that from shooting uh, one of the scenes in there. Uh, apparently he, was, he breaks in through a pair of like uh, great glass French doors and, well... The doors were not properly loosened by the prop shop guy, so he bursts through them as he's supposed to and dislocates his shoulder in the process. The glass was not sugar glass. It was actual glass, and for anyone who doesn't know the difference, uh, yeah, that's not nearly as good. So he wound up stuck through with pin cushions. I mean, and it, it didn't it doesn't seem to phase him at all. I mean, he's still on screen. He's still acting. He still goes through with it. You know, and again, getting that... I'm trying to, the the closest comparable thing I can think of as far as what he was able to accomplish with uh, again body language and presence and, and it's very different mind you but again kind of the closest thing I think is uh, what you've seen Andy Circus do recently with motion capture work in that he's able to act so well with everything I mean including his face but his whole body becomes part of what he's using to convey the story. It's not just in the eyes or the voice. Everything he does is designed to contribute to that overall story. And it's something that I think a lot of actors tend to forget as far as what they can do when they're on camera. You don't have to just, you know, you're not limited to your face. You're not limited by your face. And a lot of guys are. I mean, a couple of specific examples real quickly. Uh, James Marsden, who played Cyclops in those first X-Men movies, the poor guy is a fine actor, but it seems like there's a visor over his face and he can't do anything when he's got something on his face. When there, and Again, I can't say there are too many people who would have done more with the role, but he can't seem to get over the fact that there's this giant prosthesis on his face. Uh, Johnny Depp can't seem to act through makeup. This is a topic that Sean Comer and I have talked about many times. And it, it, it's such a huge credit to Lee that it doesn't matter if he can't... He does, Oh, God. We're get, when we move on to Dracula, there's actually, I found this online, His the entirety of his spoken lines across like the four or five Dracula movies he did for Hammer consists of a grand total of like nine minutes of actual dialogue, which is insane when you consider how well he's remembered and thought of to make that kind of an impact with so little dialogue, and in some cases, actual screen time. I mean, yeah, if you don't mind... In, in fact... Go ahead. In Dracula, Prince of Darkness, which is the second film in that series from Hammer, the, their legendary Dracula series, he does not have a line of dialogue. He says nothing, literally nothing, throughout the entirety of that film. His screen time is basically anything audible from him is kind of a hissing noise or a growling noise. And everything else he does is exactly what we've been talking about. It's his presence, his emoting, his facials. That's what he does in that whole movie. His his real dispute with those movies and why they, they alleged to only have that much time with him was that they he had disputes over the over with the hammer as far as how the movie should be done and some things that went on with them. And basically he alleged that he got blackmailed into doing those movies at times because of them telling him, Hey, well, we've already committed to making this film. Think of all the people you're going to put out of work. If you refuse to do it, we sold it on the basis that you're in it. And he says he went to work kind of protestingly because he didn't want other people to go out of work. And he feels that they, they intentionally created stories to minimize the time he spent on screen and he called it a formula where if you look at those movies, they basically have a plot that's about everything but Dracula. He's just a plot device. And yet the most remembered thing about those movies is his performance and what he was able to do. Yeah, If you don't mind a little bit of the old uh, pro wrestling parlance here, yeah, the man was given, you know, a three minute television match, likely including entrances. And he made himself the only thing you remembered from that entire show. Uh, it's just 
I don't. It's just kind of a mentality that he had about it, and his commitment as an actor. I mean, it's a crying shame that he didn't get more time because, uh, as far as Dracula's go, I think all around he's probably the best. I mean, we talked about this before a little bit, but I mean, Lugosi gets a lot of credit for being the first one, but apart from that, I think the most associated kind of visual that most people have with Dracula is Christopher Lee. And to be able to accomplish all that with so little you know, time actually spent doing it, it's absolutely incredible. You, you, you get that takeaway from him where he took a role of arguably the most iconic villain character in, you know, in, in existence, a villain that's carried over into every medium possible has constantly been reinvented, reinterpreted, brought back to life, no pun intended, over and over again, much much like he was in the films. And yet, whenever people talk about who the best was, not necessarily who the most uh, the most thought of with the role, because you you know people will always associate Lugosi because Lugosi basically created a lot of conventions by just being himself with his Hungarian accent that have taken on into the character and, and a lot of its interpretations, but you go into uh, who, who the best was. And while the original may be one, the most iconic is still to this day, Christopher Lee. And again, that's another role that you look at the caliber of people that have tackled the role of Dracula over the years. It's a long list of very, very talented, very credible actors. And he's still, I mean, again, head and shoulders, probably the best. I mean, again, you get some debate about Lugosi in a lot of ways, like you mentioned. He was, he kind of, you know, he was the first. And a lot of what we still think of as far as that goes are, is attributable to him. But, I mean, plenty of very, very good actors have tried to be Dracula, and it's just not as good. And it's, I mean, even if we forego some of the writing aspects, I mean, you know, trying to cast him as an anti-hero or, uh, you know... Crap like that, which bugs me on several levels. That's a completely different story. He's still the best. I mean, got Gary Oldman, who I am a huge fan of Gary Oldman. In fact, he's going to get his own one of these shows specifically, uh, probably a couple of weeks from now. Just was Dracula as well. Did a fine job. Frank Langella, who I think got that particular role in that version of Dracula in part because young Frank Langella has some facial characteristics similar to Christopher Lee when he was playing Dracula. But again, Langella's a fine actor. Uh, Luke Evans, who was most recently in Dracula Untold, who is, again, a fine actor. It's just not that easy to go out there and be Dracula. I mean, it's one of the biggest roles you can ask someone to do in a lot of ways, and not everyone is up to that particular challenge. And the fact that, again, I mean, these movies came out in, what, the 60s and 70s, uh, early 60s, most of them. He's still, you know, all these years later, he's still pretty much the best. You can't really say a whole lot more about how good he was in that role other than that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I defy anyone to watch those movies and not get have some kind of visceral reaction when he comes on screen as Dracula. You know, the movies, you know, they're dated, don't get me wrong, I've seen my share of them, but that kind of screen presence, that kind of impact, it, it's timeless. It is absolutely timeless. Everything else maybe, you know, feels a little different or weird if you're used to a different visual aesthetic, but anyone who has that kind of presence, that doesn't, it doesn't matter what decade it's from, what era, if you've got that, you've got it, and he most certainly has it. I. Uh, as far as his timeline goes, he actually left England uh, not too long after all those movies were made because he didn't want to be typecast, which is a legitimate concern. I mean, again, not just because he was so, because he was so good at it and because horror movies, kind of the dirty little secret of Hollywood is that they're cheap. If they're done right, they turn huge profits. And almost every major production studio is built around a horror franchise. And none of them like to talk about it, but it's... Well, Universal doesn't mind because, again, they have all those movies. But New Line was built on Freddy. Lionsgate was absolutely built by uh, Jigsaw. And Hammer was pretty much built on Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. And he didn't want to be typecast. He actually took some comedic roles. Uh, he, uh, Steven Spielberg's 1941. Uh, funny story about that. He turned down a role in the first Airplane movie to shoot 1941. He has gone on record in saying he regrets that decision. Uh, and he actually he actually reasons. got the role in 1941 
because he agreed to host Saturday Night Live in its early years. And people were shocked by that because, you know, he's so associated with playing these, not not even just horror villains, but villains in general. And people are like, can, can he do comedy? And then he went, like, he goes ahead and gives one of the best guest hosting performances in the show's early years. And just on the basis of him doing sketches, gets this part in 1941, which may have been, you know, a critical failure, but that has more to do with the production and the performances involved when you consider a cast that also has the likes of John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd in their respective primes. Yeah, that's... And I would still hold up his guest performance on Saturday Night Live to anyone who's done it recent, uh, ever, really. I mean, I, again, I think quite highly of it. And it's so much better. It's almost as good because he's so... It's not what you think of. You know, you, you expect him in kind of serious situations, and he goes out there and performs comedy very well. You know, it's not something, again, a lot of people in his in that position have that kind of versatility, and he absolutely did. Yeah, you go from playing, you know, the, the classic lineup of monsters that he played to, uh, you know, a, a fictionalized version almost of Rasputin, the real Rasputin, uh, who in many ways is science fiction in his real life, uh, the, yeah. the the legendary Fu Manchu character, who's you know nowadays it's not it's not PC to mention Fu Manchu because he portrayed seemingly every negative Asian stereotype that you could when he was conceived as a villainous character, and he goes from that to stealing the show on a comedy show and getting part you know these parts because people find out he's not just this type of actor he's just a brilliant actor period. Yeah, that brings us to, uh, I don't know if I may have skipped this chronologically, but there's one I have to bring up here because I feel this is one of those movies that is either forgotten or overlooked or just not seen enough. And I don't know if you've seen it. I forgot to bring this up before the show with you. But, so I'll go ahead and ask you on the air, why not? Uh, We can edit this out. No, I'm just kidding. I don't edit this. Uh, What you see is what you get, folks. Uh, Have you seen the original (laughs) Wicker Man? Out of just curiosity. Oh, of course I have. Of course I have. Then you know what I mean when I say it seems like one of those movies that gets either forgotten or just flies under the radar, or God help us all, people only think of the awful Nicolas Cage version. I hate that movie so much. Uh, uh, But I want to talk about that one because that's uh, a brief story. I actually watched the Nick Cage version of The Wicker Man first, and I was... uh, Yes, uh, my brother uh, told me this is the worst thing you'll ever see both stupid and a little bit dubious about that, said, oh, okay, we'll see about that. So I watched it, and it remains pretty much the worst thing I've ever seen. Uh, But as I was uh, walking through the Hollywood video years ago when there were still rental stores everywhere, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I happened across it. I saw the Nicolas Cage version, which I'd already seen, and I gave the Sideshow Bob shudder. But sitting immediately to its left was the Wicker Man with a different top, with a different picture on the cover. And I picked it up and done in 1970-whatever, starring Christopher Lee. And I said, well, all right, let's give this a shot, because I'm a Christopher Lee fan. I don't know how you screw up that story that badly. Because if you've ever seen the original, first of all, see the original. If you're... If you're kind of a horror fan, or I would even say the original is almost more of a suspense thriller than an out-and-out horror movie, if you want to categorize it specifically, in a lot of ways, because there's not a lot of violence, gore, it's very kind of atmospheric, character-driven, kind of a mystery, and the first one is just, the original is so, so good, and it kind of hinges on Lee's performance as the the arch-villain Lord Summerisle. And I don't want to go into the whole movie uh, because it would take far too long. But there's a couple of scenes where he is in his office with the lead character, and I forget the actor who plays him, uh, much to my personal embarrassment. The detective? And and he's just... uh, It's Edward Woodward. uh, I knew it was something like that. It's one of those odd names. But yeah, and uh, Edward Woodward. And their interactions are glorious. I mean, this is a guy who, in a few minutes... Again... Uh, as far as actual screen time, it's relatively limited, but his presence is just so unnerving in the most understated way possible. You hear him talk, and everything he says makes sense, but you get this feeling that this there's something very, very wrong here, uh, which of course plays out completely as it's supposed to, but I mean, not a lot of people can do that, and again, I, I have to urge everyone, if you haven't seen the original, make make some time, put forth a little effort, Find it, enjoy it, because it's very, very good. 
And for the love of all that's holy, ignore the Nicolas Cage version. Should you ever see it, I would encourage you all to commit arson. Burn it where it stands. The world, no one will convict you for that. No one. Uh, maybe Texas. <laughs> Texas pot shot. All right. Uh, sorry, I ran a little bit there. So specifically, as far as the Wicker Man goes, anything you wanted to say there? Um, the interesting story about the Wicker Man is that Lee had gotten into this project um, where he met with the screenwriter, a guy named Anthony Schaefer, and then they got director Robin Hardy on board and had a British line to produce it, a man named Peter Snell. They wanted to make a movie based on old religion, and for the basis, they used a, a novel by David Pinner called Ritual, in which a devout Christian policeman is going to investigate what looks to be a ritualistic novel, or a ritualistic murder in the novel, and they decided they had to adapt it, but the budget they were given was so small that Lee, who believed in it so much, offered to play Summer Isle for free because he knew that this movie was going to be great, and he knew that this was going to be something that people would talk about for years and years and years, and to this day, he considers it the best film he's ever made. And Summer Isle, un until he played the founder of Pakistan in a movie that got <laughs> you know massive critical acclaim when he played Muhammad Ali Jinnah, that was the role he always pointed to as he thinks, I did my best acting here, pointing to Lord Summer Isle. Until, you know, 1998 when he played Jaina. Uh, which says a whole lot about how much he enjoyed that particular role because uh, Jaina is one of those sweeping epic stories that uh, just fabulous and he carries that one uh, masterfully by and large. Uh, moving on from Wicker Man, I, I had to get that out there because I know there's a lot of people out there who only have association with the Nicolas Cage version. And I just, I, again, I have to plead with you. That, mo that version sucks. Watch the good version. And again, I don't know how they botched that remake so badly. I can point to Nicolas Cage. Don't get me wrong. He doesn't carry the movie the way a lead kind of should. But there are a host of writing and production errors and problems with that film that go way beyond Nicolas Cage being bipolar, going from normal to screaming Nicolas Cage. Doesn't help, but he is far from the only flaw in that. Ugh. Again, my issues with that movie. God, it's so bad. If you haven't seen it, don't. That, there's my review of that one. Don't. It's not worth the time or energy. All right, uh, the other one I want to touch on kind of from about this same era is another one you and I talked about previously. Um, his turn as the James Bond villain uh, Francisco Scaramanga in uh, The Man with the Golden Gun, which is... Uh, again, you and I talked about a little bit about this previously on um, the James Bond uh, part one of the James Bond series we did. I'm pimping all my old stuff tonight, everybody. You just you'll have to go back and re-listen to it. It's still there, I promise. But he and uh, he's opposite Roger Moore, who's one of the better uh, Bonds by and large, or at least considered that way. My opinions aside, and he's again. This is one of those things that we've already mentioned presence. He is a legitimate threat to James Bond, and that's not something a lot of Bond villains have. A lot of them are never actually a threat. They put him in peril, but the number of people who are believably threats to the character of James Bond is shockingly small, and Scaramanga ranks among the very best as goes. And, and the thing is, too, with Scaramanga, he's not looked at as one of those prolific, everlasting James Bond villains the, the way you know somebody like Goldfinger or Dr. No is. Yeah, in many ways, he's probably, if you're crafting a perfect foil for Bond, it's Scaramanga, particularly in the way Lee plays him, because he di he differentiates from the novel, as, as most of the James Bond films do, but this is one of those times you can point to it and say, this is really a better take on it, because in the novel, I think Lee actually is, is credited with the quote saying, he's just a West Indian thug, whereas in the movie... The Scaramanga you see is almost an, an inverted James Bond, where he's 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 very much in line with the same qualities as Bond, where he's he's this you know elegant kind of charming guy, but completely lethal at the same time. And it's almost a, a different. It's it's he's a guy who you could have easily seen James Bond turning into had his mentalities and loyalties been shifted that way, and that's what makes the character so good but it wouldn't have worked out as well if you didn't have somebody who could convey these things as well as christopher lee could and it's funny because 
we talk about nowadays how acting is a little bit of a lost art where the the movie business is a much more cosmetic business in terms of their leading men and ladies than it was at one time and it, you go back and see somebody like Lee utilize these little things that will always make him stand out and you watch it now after being subjected to a lot of modern quote unquote actors and it really makes you appreciate the people who mastered their craft the way this guy did. And it's why he still stands out and why even into his 80s, he books extremely prominent roles in very high profile movies. Yeah, for me, the main thing that I remember about Man with the Golden Gun is when he and James Bond are on his island and they're negotiating their duel. And he meant, and they're setting up the terms of that. And he mentions, okay, Bond, you get your famous Walther, I'll have my gun. And Roger Moore kind of very subtly raises an eyebrow and goes, "My, you get one shot to my six shots. And Christopher Lee's response is so subtle in terms of what he does with his posture and his face, but he gets just the barest hint of a smirk. His whole posture shifts and his response is, I only need one shot. Brilliant display of being able to convey everything you want to convey. I mean, that line could be get, could be delivered any number of ways. And everything else apart from the line and delivery, you even if you're just like if you can't hear that whole scene and you're just watching it captioned, you still know exactly the tone with which he delivered it because he conveys it with everything in his body. Everything that's on camera shows that confidence and that arrogance. And it's not something most people do. It's, uh, again, it's a very lost art in a lot of ways, uh, which is a crying shame by and large. But uh, that's, again, a completely different discussion at times. All right, let me see what else I wanted to bring up here. Uh, because there was something else right around. I want to say there was something else. Oh, well, uh, all right. One thing I want to bring up real quickly, and then I want to get into some of his. Uh, kind of collaborate, because he's done a lot of collaborative work with uh, Tim Burton, who I have mixed feelings about, as anyone who's heard me discuss the subject knows. But uh, the last thing I want to touch on specifically is his role in the 1985 sequel to The Howling, uh, The Howling 2. And, boy. Uh, I, is it because he, he, he plays against type and plays a good guy? Well, yeah. I mean, the same reason you have to kind of bring up uh, Robert England as the uh, Captain Ahab character in uh, Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. It's just so against type, but it still works. I mean, again, it's a credit to a good actor that you can go on either side of that particular aisle and be just as believable in either uh, in either side. But uh, I feel like that one needs to be brought up just because of how successful some of those early Howling movies were. Uh I'm Howling not was the one of those first those first but... it was one of those first series to really take advantage of video distribution as far as not necessarily le- needing a wide theatrical release because the producers of the film understood how strong the home video market was becoming in the mid 1980s and specifically for the horror genre uh the, it became a huge huge tool because you were able to make these movies on a lighter budget because you weren't seeking the distribution money for major theaters and as long as you had that first initial foot in the door with the first entry in the series as a theatrical release and it did well, people who were making a regular thing at the time out of going to the video store on a Friday night or a Saturday night, and you know, you, you have a market where there are couples looking for uh, you know, a scary movie, usually the young husband and wife or boyfriend and girlfriend or people who are dating, they want to do something, they rent the movie. And because the first telling was very commercially successful – People knew it. People liked it. They took a bankable horror name in Christopher Lee. They they had limited theatrical release, which was fine, and all they really needed, kind of doing the minimum in that regard, but they understood that video market, and so they have a bankable name that people know and people like. They have a movie that's a direct sequel to a movie that people loved and was very successful. You put those elements together... And the movie was very successful for what it was supposed to be. And actually, the critical reaction for a straight-to-video horror sequel is fairly favorable. And most of that has to do with the role Lee played. Because if you look at the other leads in that movie, Red Brown is somewhat recognizable because he had played some significant parts in the 70s and early 80s. Uh, 
specifically he was Captain America in two ill-fated television pilot movies, the second of which, mind you, featured the lead villain of Miguel, a terrorist played by one Christopher Lee. Yeah, he's... Again, Christopher Lee's done a lot of stuff. Uh, again, his filmography is rather extensive and a lot of good stuff. And just real briefly to mention his comedic stuff again, uh, he plays, I believe, I haven't seen this movie in a really long time, but uh, the second Police Academy movie, actually, uh, he plays, I believe, the villain. The seventh. Uh, correct, sorry, what seventh was that, the Police seventh? Academy movie. Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, but, yeah, he's uh, Mission to Moscow. Here it is. Yeah, he plays the villain in that, doesn't he? And I mean, anyone who's seen those movies knows how ludicrous they are. But by I think by Police Academy 5, most of us had checked out, or at least most of us, I hope, had checked out. <laughs> um, but, yeah, actually, Mission to Moscow, Police Academy 7, um, I think the only redeeming quality is that he's the star in, in pretty much the, the entire movie because – I think of the original cast, you've got Bubba Smith as Hightower. Uh, you, you've got, uh, hmm, I think, I think Commandant Lassar is still in it. But that's really all I remember out of it. And you've got Lee kind of pretending to be this uh, Russian guy reaching out to the United States for police help. And then you find out he's the counter terrorist that they're after the whole time. And he's basically banking on the ineptitude of the Russian police. Uh, yeah, it's... He's again. He, there's a lot of stuff he's done. Um, oh, uh, I almost overlooked this, but uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention his turn as the uh, the traditional mad scientist in uh, the second Gremlins movie, which is one of those odd. Again, it, the Long Road to Ruin uh, did a special on the two Gremlins movies, which I found to be by and large accurate. Uh, and he, Christopher Lee as again the crazy mad scientist, uh, Doctor Catheter. Oh god, <laughs> those movies! Uh, you can tell he's having just a lot of fun, kind of menacing poor Gizmo there uh, in that one, and then uh, again creating some of the monstrosities that he does. But uh, again, even as kind of the cartoony villainous mad scientist, he's still fun to watch on screen. Well, that goes back to him kind of playing Fu Manchu too, because it, he, you know, he's he's very clearly not Asian. Yet he's playing an Asian to begin with in heavy, heavy makeup. And you it's know that the franchise bad. is... I'll give you that. Him playing Fu Manchu is not quite as bad as, oh, I believe John Wayne played Genghis Khan once. Uh, yeah, yeah. And horrible. played it straight, which was a terrible, terrible miscalculation on his part. But he's not much of an actor, in my opinion. So we'll, I'll leave that there. That's another podcast for another day. Uh, wh- that would be when I get drafted as a bad guy. <laughs> as far as actual acting, I'd agree John Wayne played himself a lot. But again, he, I think he's one of those guys who got by a lot on screen presence. Uh, yeah, but but again, it, go, it goes – you can look back at him doing the Fu Manchu series, and it was five movies. Yeah. And he's Ooh. playing, you know, he's playing an Asian, you know, terrorist, basically. Clearly not Asian. And yet, throughout those five movies – Fu Manchu is one of those villains who's more famous than his nemesis. In this case, Sir Dennis Nayland Smith is the regular, you know, foil to Fu Manchu. Fu Manchu is more famous than Sir Dennis Nayland Smith. I don't think anybody will be able to name Dennis Nayland Smith one out of it. Maybe one out of ten will know who he is in terms of, uh, who you know, Fu Manchu. But Fu Manchu is the one who carries the series and. Smith was recast in, I believe, every one of the five films that they did, but Lee was the constant as Fu Manchu. And part of it is because, yes, he was becoming a bankable name, but at the same time, they know what these movies are supposed to be, and he knows it, and he's having fun in these movies, being very campy, over the top, and I think that's the draw. Yeah, it has to be at this point in time. I mean, otherwise they're just horrible. But uh, there's nothing wrong with a good, fun, campy movie. And anyone who disagrees with that, I think, takes this stuff a little bit too serious. Uh, uh, Lee's kind of reintroduction, for want of a better phrase. He's, he, the guy has worked steadily uh, since he started, mind you. He's released one to two movies every year since, oh, 1957, 55, around there. 50. Uh, 50, let's see. Yeah, 55. No, no, he actually started like in 48. Uh, and he, no, yeah, he's been pretty consistent since 1948, as far as one to two movies every year. 
but his kind of reintroduction to uh, a bigger kind of name, a bigger kind of uh, audience, came when he was cast as Saruman in uh, the Lord of the Rings movies. Now, I know uh, Pat hasn't seen, has not a big, uh, not too up on them, so I'm going to kind of be carrying this. Uh, I'll just ask real briefly before I go on about all the things I think were right about this. Uh, when you had kind of, uh, were you at all aware uh, when they announced his casting in that role? Did that affect you at all if you were aware of it? I mean, because I heard that and I was an extraordinarily happy because again, I knew he would uh, be great in that role. But I'm just curious as to whether or not his presence in those movies, uh, when you heard about it, was uh, positive or a negative for you. It was it was absolutely positive because you know even though I'm not a fan of the Lord of the Rings series you know Gasp I know uh, I, you know I was familiar with the Hobbit having had to read it several times throughout my my academic career and you know so I was familiar with the character of Sauron as he started and I kind of knew what eventually happens to him in the Lord of the Rings series because I have friends who were into the series and I you know I I get the character and you need somebody who can pull that off well. And when I heard they were going to use Christopher Lee in that role, I said, yep, you can't really do any better than that to play a villainous, evil, older wizard who is kind of the the source of all that is wrong, for lack of a better way to phrase it. And that the, this was somebody that was going to be directly confronted by Gandalf, who was being portrayed by Sir Ian McKellen. And I said, you're going to really need somebody to deal, to be seen as someone who can match that presence that McKellen brings. And then, you know, and McKellen, it's funny because McKellen in a lot of ways reminds me of Peter Cushing, who is just going to forever be linked to Lee in their careers. I think they have a very similar speaking pattern. I think they have a very similar physical appearance right down to the hairstyles. And so when I saw that they were going to cast Lee opposite McKellen in these roles, I kind of got a little bit nostalgic because I felt like it was as close as you could get to a reunion of Lee and Cushing. And I feel like McKellen would certainly be someone capable of doing that if there was anybody. So I love the pairing. And to be honest, while I don't enjoy the films, if I'm channel surfing and, you know, they're having a marathon on or, you know, one of the networks is airing one of the films, if I see it's at a point where he's in it, I stop and I watch. Yeah, uh, being on screen with either Christopher Lee or uh, Ian McKellen, both knighted, both sirs, I just kind of forego. I'm not going to be st- throwing sir in front of them every time I say it. It's going to get tedious for everyone both involved. Con- both also considered for the role of Magneto before it ultimately went to McKellen. Uh, that was probably the right call. Not that I don't think Lee would have been awesome, but uh, I don't think you could do better than McKellen. Granted, some of that's hindsight. Uh, again, either one of them on screen has the potential to just swallow it up. It's not easy to share a screen with them and you know, be on equal footing. And all of the scenes between Saruman and Gandalf, and there's only really the one, but it's so awesome. That little kind of wizard's duel they have in his tower, uh, his voice and the delivery of the lines, the way he kind of sets you up... Uh, Lee has that great ability to make you uneasy with just kind of innocuous things. And it's a really odd thing uh, for me to kind of single out, but even if you don't know, uh, if you're going to see like uh, Fellowship of the Ring, having never read the books, knowing nothing, when Gandalf first meets Saruman at uh, the Tower of Isengard and they start talking, you just get more and more uneasy. Uh, Just from the first time they meet until he actually reveals what's going on. Lee, with just his presence and his voice, you just get the sense that something's not right every minute that he's on screen. And to do that without going over the top or making it obvious, it's a very subtle kind of thing that he does, and it's just great. And again, uh, he has the voice that you would associate with a wizard like that. Uh, And again, screen presence. Uh, I don't think they could have done any better, and... Incidentally, with the Hobbit movies, I like the shift that they made with the character of uh, Saruman in that in the Hobbit films, he's not the bad guy. He's the most powerful uh, wizard there is. But he's not been corrupted yet. He's not evil yet. He's just a wizard with a different perspective than Gandalf's or any of the others. And to see him take that same role that he did so well being 
the evil fallen wizard and then to make it kind of the opposite in that you actually see where he's coming from a little bit and you're you're happy to see him in a lot of ways because he's again not just powerful but at this point in time he's a good guy and again everything he does on screen lets you know that and i mean even some of the lines which are still you know uh, there's the line that gandalf says that where saruman believes that it requires great power to keep evil at bay and all of his philosophy is kind of built around that but everything he does lets you know that instead of building tension making you go something's wrong here it's a very very kind of soothing presence that he has which is again in absolute stark contrast and since everything else is the same i mean again these are the same direct same director same musical you know same composer same actors it's all on it's completely on him whether or not he's able to make this character that we all know becomes evil be believable as a good guy and he does and it's again that's all a credit to his abilities and uh, I suppose I have to throw a shout out there to Peter Jackson as well because again the director has a hand in it but a lot of guys I don't know if they'd be able to do that transition for that same character believably uh, let me see the one story I want to mention about that there was some concern about whether or not Lee would be able to play Saruman he didn't want to travel to New Zealand uh, he, again, over 80 at this point, and was concerned about flying there and doing that. Uh, they actually wound up shooting, I believe, all of his scenes on a soundstage in England. And the fact that everyone else kind of went out of their way to get him to come back should just you know, speak to you about how great he was in that role. Uh, all right, the last one I want to mention specifically as far as screen roles go, then uh, we're going to briefly touch on some of his voice work, uh, singing, just kind of singing his praises. Uh, he also sings, if for those of you who didn't know. Uh, we're just about ready to wrap up. We've got five minutes left of live time. I'm not going to extend the live broadcast. I don't think this will take the full extra half hour. So to anyone listening live, we'll be done in 15, 20 minutes. Uh, we'll probably cut off between now and then. Come back at that time. The whole show will be up. You can skip ahead to this part, the, the beauty of on-demand audio. Uh, thank you all uh, to everyone out there who happens to be listening live. Uh, okay, the last thing I want to touch on real briefly before we move on to some of that other stuff. Christopher Lee in the Star Wars uh, prequel trilogy. Uh, specifically, he's in Attack of the Clones, and he has a brief uh, kind of a extended cameo in the beginning of Revenge of the Sith. Now, there's a lot of debate and malice handed towards the prequels, and a fair amount of it's deserved. Some of it is a little bit overblown, but Star Wars is practically a religion to some people, so you're going to get those... Great, those you know, huge responses. Uh, his role in uh, let's start with Attack of the Clones because it's really the only one with any meat to it. Uh, I don't know if they could have done better for cre- finding the right guy for this role because I think of his portrayal as kind of the quintessential Sith. This is a guy who is intelligent, scheming, conniving, but at the same time extraordinarily powerful, and it's. Uh, again, it's not an easy thing to pull off. I mean, there's a reason there have only been, you know, three or four on-screen Sith that we all kind of remember. And, you know, for all the problems with Attack of the Clones, and they are numerous, I don't think he's one of them. I think he carries whatever, whenever he's on screen, I think he carries himself and that portion of the movie very well. And in credit to the people who wrote the movies, I think his character gets honestly one of the media roles in Attack of the Clones, and his backstory is one of the few that's expanded on actually very well uh, to the point where you, you know this character's motivations. And when you give that kind of role to somebody who is such a proven commodity, the odds are it's going to come across as very, very good and one of the high points. And for me, it's really the only point of the new Star Wars trilogy I enjoy with any kind of zest. And a lot of that has to do with Christopher Lee. A lot of that has to do with, I think, the, the character himself being a very well-developed character. Um, where, you know, Count Dooku, or as he's called as a Sith named Darth Tyrannus, he's uh, basically rebelling against the Republic because he feels they've become bureaucratic and they, he doesn't, and he's also, as a former Jedi, he's mad at the Jedis because they don't want to help what he feels are oppressed um oppressed star systems or or planets in that same field. So he's mad at the system. He's been a part of it, trying to encourage change. And when that doesn't happen, 
he he has a, a role we've seen in various forms take place, such as uh, Sinestro in the Green Lantern mythos. Uh, you know, just that. Uh, even Lucifer, going back to Paradise Lost in the Bible, where he sees the system and doesn't like it and wants to change it. So he becomes the rebel and joins the other side, or in some cases starts the other side. And while maybe you understand his frustration and why he would do that, it's the methods he chooses to employ that really make you understand this is no longer a guy with redeeming qualities. Like when he tries to assassinate Queen Amidala by hiring Django Fett to do it. Uh, kidnapping Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, playing a hand in the death of Qui-Gon Jinn, uh, and all these things he does, and even is one of the original men who helps construct the plans for the Death Star. Um, so to, to have this weight and this logic, you have to be able to at points sympathize with him a little bit and then to understand that this is no longer a guy you can feel for. And Christopher Lee is such a virtuoso actor with his emotions, uh, his his speaking, how he can convey these to you, that this is a role where he's in the twilight of his career, and it's in a situation where he's surrounded by these effects and graphics, and it can be really easy to lose sight of his performance. And you can say maybe it's because I'm a little biased, but it's one of the only things I take away from these movies with anything positive. And the the interplay between him and Yoda, as Yoda is his former master of the Jedi, and the role he plays in trying to recruit Anakin Skywalker and ultimately meeting his fate at the hands of Anakin Skywalker. Uh, it's, you know, and then they don't, they don't, and they don't expand enough on it, but you can almost realize during the scene where spoiler alert, spoiler alert, Anakin takes Dooku's head that Dooku understands that his whole role has been used to move Anakin Skywalker over into the role he had been filling. He was a placeholder until they could bring Anakin Skywalker to their side and eventually assume the role of Darth Vader. And it's almost a little bit tragic in that way. And it, it harkens back to his performances as Dracula and the, mo the Frankenstein monster, where despite being as evil as evil gets, when it's time for them to meet their fate, the face he conveys is one in which he almost get, draws you into not want him to die. And that's kind of the great art of portraying a bad guy. You make the people love to hate you, and you make the people want to see you again. And maybe maybe more so in any other role, we got to see that on a big stage with him playing Dooku slash Tyrannus. And it's, again, I, I feel the high point of the new Star Wars trilogy. I'm completely with you. Uh, his... Uh... There are two scenes that I have a lot of fun with. Uh, first of all, you mentioned his interplay with Yoda at the end of Attack of the Clones. Uh, the other one from that same movie, when he's with Ewan McGregor, who, honestly, I think Ewan McGregor's Obi-Wan is one of the other kind of high points of those movies. Uh, take that for what you... I, take that however you want it, but I enjoyed his Obi-Wan as time went on. I mean, not so much in Phantom Menace, but Phantom Menace is a movie you watch to see things go boom. Uh, that's pretty much all it's there for. But when he's got, you know, the captured Obi-Wan and he's walking around and there, he's explaining, you know, kind of his perspective on things, why he's doing what he's doing. And Obi-Wan's sitting there, you know, levitating in manacles. And the interplay between them, I feel, is, from an acting standpoint, absolutely the high, the highlight of all three of those movies. Just that, you know, three to four minute scene when they're talking to each other in that particular way and you mentioned the look he gives uh the guy who winds up being the emperor darth sidious right before anakin kills him in the start of revenge of the sith and it's an underrated moment because it doesn't last all that long but uh sidious is sitting in the chair he's you know ostensibly been captured i mean you know again those movies but after anakin defeats him and has the lightsaber to his neck sidious says oh no you have to kill him he's far too dangerous to let live and he just looks over and he gives this look of just utter shock and horror. And you're right, it's you really don't want him to die. And there's a pretty good reason for that, because his role is essentially then passed to Grievous, and that was just a giant boat of suck for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, but uh, you you want him on screen more. I mean, you're, you're right, you love to hate him, and you, that, by extension, you hate it more when he's not on screen than when he is. And I, let's see, I think that's the last thing I wanted to talk about specifically... Uh, oh, no, there's one other, uh, real briefly, one that I have to shout out. Okay, I, 
again, I'm not a huge fan of Tim Burton's work, by and large. Feel free to throw stuff at me if you feel so inclined. I'm just not. Um, so it's not a huge leap of logic that I don't care much for his version of Alice in Wonderland, which I don't have a great deal of affection for as a story overall. But he's got a couple of lines as the Jabberwocky. Now, for anyone who knows what that is, and I'm not sure I completely agree with the visual interpretation that they gave it in that movie because it's just a dragon. But I remember kind of reading through the casting list for that movie, and you've got so many great actors that have basically cameos in that movie. And he's got one as the Jabberwocky, and that I've seen the movie. That was the highlight when he stares down the poor girl playing Alice, and, oh, so we meet again, and I've never seen you before. And his response is great because it's, I don't speak to you, insignificant wielder. I speak to the Vorpal Blade, which was just one of the it's one of those great it's one of the great underrated insults that I can think of off the top of my head. No, you don't matter at all. I'm talking to that thing. But I I don't think you again, your voice casting the Jabberwocky, which is one of those you know, kind of iconic creatures if you're familiar with it at all and again, you couldn't have done better than Christopher Lee. Uh again, just the the way he uses his voice is just phenomenal. Plenty of voice actors could take a lesson or two from him. So uh, anyway, was there anything else that uh we kind of may have glossed over that you wanted to touch on before we go into final thoughts here. I mean, as far as his, his real iconic villain roles, we we really have gone over just the majority of them. And he's played villain roles in, in smaller films um, that were kind of, some of them are B movies. Some of them are, you know, again, hammer films where he, he plays a villainous role or doesn't, or actually turns completely around and plays a role like Sherlock Holmes uh, which he's done, or not, not sure. And uh, you know, he's played in Sherlock Holmes films and Hound of the Baskerville, uh, produced by Hammer. Um, he's just a guy who will never ever stop acting for as long as he's alive, which I think we can all be grateful for. And his real life is what translates so much of that into what's successful. He filmed a lot of the lightsaber scenes as Count Dooku himself because he's got a background in fencing. He was able to use his military and world traveling experience to garner roles internationally in films produced in Spain and films produced in Italy because he speaks so many languages. This is a guy who worked in the English Special Forces during World War II. Uh, and, and to this day, when asked about it, we'll say, we're not legally allowed to discuss what we did, which makes it all the more cool to hear that. And to see him go on and take these roles and just to add to what's been one of the most prolific careers. And this is after he's turned down roles or, or just missed out on roles that have made other people's careers. In, in that, the Halloween film franchise, he was the original choice to play Dr. Sam Loomis. And it was both offered to both him and Peter Cushing who turned him down. And Lee has said that's the biggest regret of his career. Well, when you have a big career regret like that in a role that clearly is an iconic role and led to a lot more work for Donald Pleasance that he may not have gotten afterward, the fact – and it's still to this day arguably Donald Pleasance's most remembered performance. And this is, again, a guy who's one of the oh, Bond easily. villains in its most iconic forms. And when you pass that up but you still have arguably one of the greatest careers in the history of you know, professional acting, you haven't done so bad. And <laughs> – while he's mostly identified as a villain, obviously we're doing the show about him. He's 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 gone to, you know, he's done comedy well. He you know, the Misadventures of Sherlock Holmes by Billy Wilder, where he plays Sherlock's intelligent brother Mycroft. Um, it just you know the we talk about voice acting uh, that you you mentioned and how he's done films like a film I used to really enjoy when I was a kid, although. I kind of enjoyed it years later in college under the influence of certain substances called The Last Unicorn, which itself is just <laughs> a, a a large trip. But when I was a kid, I loved it, and his voice is one of the things I always remembered. Uh, he's he, The most recent thing I saw him in was actually the first time he'd done a, a Hammer-associated movie since the mid-1970s because of his dissatisfaction with that. And it was a movie with... Uh, Hillary Swank and Jeffrey Dean Morgan, and it was called The Resident. And oh, well, the movie, movie itself is not – it's not a terrible movie. It's just very predictable, and I'm not the biggest Hillary Swank fan. No, he has you don't a, say. He has, a, he has a small role, and he steals the show. 
just by being sinister because while he's played every role, it's those villain roles he always goes back to. And I think the reason for that is because he enjoys his role as an, a villainous icon and, again, a small, somewhat inconsequential role in that, but he makes it. And I think that's what he does in everything. And the more you see of him, the better something is. And I, there's not a lot of actors you can say that about and mean it in every role they play, but he's one of them. Well, if you want another example of that, uh, God, God help me, I'm going to bring up Tim Burton again. Uh, his revision of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, which has so many problems. I, I could list them, but I won't. But Christopher Lee's couple of appearances as Willy Wonka's strict, overbearing, anti-sweet dentist father uh, was, for me, one of the highlights of that whole thing. Just getting to watch him on screen in that particular role being just... You know, he tells uh, young Willy Wonka at one point, no son of mine will be a chocolatier. You And Willy's response is, I'm going to, you know, being a typical child, I'm going to run away from home, I'm going to see the world. And he does, and it lasts about a day, as most of those things do. And he gets back in the whole house. And there's just something about the way Lee kind of commands those few minutes he has on screen that makes you think, you know, no, he, he would have done that. And then uh, you know, he shows up again at the end for kind of the reconciliation. But again... I think one of the better things about that whole movie, and again, that may not be saying a whole lot from my perspective because I'm not really a fan of the movie, but he does it so very well. It's just, again, it's maximizing your time on screen. No matter what it is, no matter what the role is, he's he finds a way to make sure you remember that he was in that particular movie. And that's a mentality that a lot of guys could do better, would be a lot better off if they had. Uh, it's just the right, attitude to have when you're going to be when you're in anything doesn't matter how big or how small it is you find a way to make yourself memorable and it helps that he's devoted so much of his time and his energy and his life to you know controlling his face his voice his overall body because i mean i think the biggest takeaway i have kind of from his entire career is the ability to act again i mentioned this earlier not just with your face or not just with your eyes but with your whole body you're not limited by your face you you can emote with things beyond that. And anyone out there who maybe doesn't believe me or maybe has a hard time with it, go back to his stuff where he can't talk or he can't emote with his face or even some of the stuff where he does and just look at what he does with the rest of his body and his posture and just kind of the overall feel that he gives as a human being. And look at how he manipulates it. It's something that a lot of guys could, would do a lot of good if they knew how to do it properly. And again, there's a lot of guys who are so limited by that, and you don't have to be. And if you, again, if you don't believe me, look at his career. It's it's right there. It's certainly possible. Uh, and that's kind of my closing thought there. All right, Pat, any final thoughts you have on this one? And then we're going to do plugs and wrap up. Um, you know, he's he's so beloved as an actor who played a villain, and you can look to other guys who've got careers where they were either typecast as villains. Uh, or, you know, even his contemporaries and friends, Vincent Price and Peter Cushing, where they had a near impossible time breaking out of the horror genre. And in the case of Vincent Price, who's a wonderful actor, never did. Um, you know, it, it to me shows just how much people thought of him and still do to this day and how much they're willing to, to work with him, to take him out of these roles that he's so associated with and put him into anything. And he always succeeds. You won't find a movie where there's a bad review given to a performance by him, no matter how bad the movie may be. And, you know, there are some bad ones out there, even including, you know, the Lee Cushing team, like Horror Express, which I, I think is kind of a, a poor a poor film in its own right. But those – and even the Fu Manchu movies where, you know, you get to number three and four in the series and you're like, okay, guys, I, think, I feel like we've been here before. But he never – gives you less than the best he's doing with the material. And it's not that he's going out there to try to win an Oscar every time. He has this understanding of how to make the most of what he's doing with what he has. And I think when an actor gets that, they're never going to be hard up for work. And they're always going to be somebody who will draw people to see something, no matter how disinterested they are in the, the material surrounding it. And that's why he's been working steadily for you know, 70 plus years. There's nobody else you can really say that about for the most part who's had that level of success, has become an icon, 
and has become an icon not just in you know his chosen field of acting, but because of his you know horror roles, he became very beloved by fans of heavy metal and horror metal, and released albums. And yeah. if, <laughs> to anyone out there, if you have not heard his Christmas carols, stop what you're doing. Pause this. We'll be back. Go to YouTube. Go go to you. Buy them if you can, if you need to use nefarious means, because you're not going to take my word for it. Find one of them, and just listen. It's insane that he can actually vocalize in heavy metal that well, and so far, again, in his 80s, the man is releasing heavy metal album, and people like Jing- him. Jingle Hell charted on the Billboard Hot 100. It entered the chart at number 22, and... It made him the oldest perfor- living performer to ever enter the charts at 91 years of age, six months. It, it got to number 18. The man he beat out, to put it in perspective, as the former oldest to have a song chart is Tony Bennett. Tony Bennett is a musical icon, at least in my world he is. I think he's one of the finest vocalists to ever live. And yet Christopher Lee comes ahead and at, 90, at almost 92 years of age. He he breaks the record and charts a song in the top 20, a Christmas song, a morbid Christmas song, on a second Christmas album. Yeah. It's insane when you actually think about it, you know? There's uh, – it's crazy. I mean, uh, his voice work uh, – there's actually an audio book out there of him reading Bram Stoker's Dracula. Now, I'm a huge fan of that book anyway, but if you – don't have the time or the energy to sit down and actually read it. If you need an audio version, find that one. I guarantee you, it's probably the best you'll get. And there's a, uh, it, it's amazing. Again, he's just absolutely one of the all-time best. Uh, I, again, I tend to kick these things off by jumping into the deep end. And Christopher Lee is, I said it at the top, he might be the best villainous actor of all time. And I've got plenty of other guys I'm gonna that are gonna throw their hats into that proverbial ring in the coming weeks. And I'll thank you all in advance for joining me on those shows as well. But I'm, you know, we're starting out here with maybe the best, and everyone else is kind of going to be chasing Lee as far as potentially earning that title, I think. Uh, and on that note, which is, I think, a fine note, we're going to be wrapping this up. Uh, Mr. Mullen, it's always a pleasure to have you on this show, and you know you're always welcome here. Do you have anything you would like to plug before we go? Uh, yes, I do, actually. Uh, and the pleasure is all mine, as, as always, Robert. Uh but I'll, I'll leave you with this little story before we get into plugs real quick. Um, so when I was in element, well, the stage of junior high school, although my junior high school was in elementary school as well, so I always called it elementary school. When I was in the seventh and eighth grade, I had a teacher who was one of the real good influences in my life named Mr. Bill Mason. And if you're listening to Mr. Mason, which you probably are because this is about Christopher Lee, enjoy. Um, so he found out I was a huge Christopher Lee fan when during Halloween he – for literature class, he got to let us look into, you know, myths about vampires and werewolves and the like. And I found out he was a huge horror fan, specifically of Hammer Horror. And he was impressed that not only had I seen at least one of the movies at the time, I'd actually seen about three or four of them, but that I was a fan of them. And then I knew who Christopher Lee was and we got, and you know, we would talk about it and have fun with it. And so I found out that he has an autograph, he had an autograph picture of Christopher Lee. One of the two autograph pictures he had that he was most proud of, along with, uh, at least in my mind, he had one of William Daniels, too, best known as Mr. Feeney from Boy Meets World. But this was because he was such a fan of his portrayal as John Adams in 1776. So he held it over my head that he had the writing address to get an, a signed autograph picture of Christopher Lee. And basically used it to help keep me in line and not go too crazy, because I was a little bit wild of a kid at the time, and I was a little bit of a, a class clown and... I know that's hard to believe, but it's true. No way, really? I, I know, surprisingly enough. Uh, but so one day, it's a downtime in class where a lot of the kids who are involved in chorus are downstairs and singing, and that wasn't really my forte, so I didn't do it. And we would just use the time to study, catch up on homework and whatever. And so he hands me a Post-it note, kind of out of nowhere, very quietly. And I look at the Post-it note, and on it is the mailing address to get this autographed picture of Christopher Lee. And I'm, you know, with bated breath awaiting day after day after I mail this out. And I had included, you know, a handwritten letter telling him about how much I loved his career and everything. And surprisingly enough, I got a, a letter 
written to me, personalized, thanking me for being a fan and with an autographed picture that was personalized. And to this day, I still thank Mr. Mason for hooking me up with that address, which I probably wouldn't have ever found otherwise. And I don't know how he did. I don't question his methods. And as his famous quote was, there are things worth going to jail for. <laughs> so, uh, but it was just always it was just always something that was really cool and always sticks out to me to this day as one of the the real good times and, and something that will always mean something to me. So thanks again, Mr. Mason, if you're listening out there, which you probably are. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, this uh, over at the Casual Heroes, I took part in their last WrestleCast, which was a phenomenal train wreck. We discussed the upcoming Royal Rumble, the fallout from the last edition of Monday Night Raw, as well as some news that broke during the week. Uh, I am halfway through a two-part piece that'll be about the kayfabe character, the character of Hulk Hogan and why he is a terrible friend to his alleged friends. Not about Terry Jean Balea in real life. He's probably a pretty decent friend since Brian Nobbs and Brutus Beefcake seems to always find some kind of work. But this will be about the character of Hulk Hogan and why he's been a terrible friend to seemingly everybody he's ever befriended in, in, on screen in wrestling. And uh, I have, I'm having a blast writing it and including you know certain examples. And I think for any fan of Hulk Hogan of that era of wrestling or maybe somebody who just wants some historical perspective, you really enjoy it. Uh, and I'll have an article coming afterward called Crossroads about how two iconic performers, the upcoming Hall of Fame inductee Macho Man Randy Savage and former Hall of Fame inductee Dusty Rhodes have, despite two of the prolific, most prolific careers in the sport of wrestling, uh, happened to meet each other at the seeming lowest point of each of their respective careers and why it's significant. I'll be looking forward to those. Uh, make sure and send me a link once they're up. Uh, real quick. I haven't listened to the Casual Heroes one yet, but who's your pick to win the Rumble? Do you have one yet? Uh, we, we each gave two picks, our, our true favorite and our dark horse. My Mine is, I, I really feel that they're going to go with Roman Reigns as the winner, and my dark horse was the potentially returning Randy Orton. Oh, God, not Randy Orton. That's my one my one wish. Uh, I got to stop throwing those out. I throw them out every now and then. One, one you know, quasi-wish, be it... MMA or professional wrestling, and I always get kicked in the teeth. Ugh, I, <laughs> UFC re-signs Mirko Krokop. Don't match him up with Gonzaga. No one cares. You have uh, Fight Night from Poland, headlined by Krokop Gonzaga. I just walked right into that one, didn't I? Please, don't match up Roy McDonald and Hector Lombard. It's going to suck. I know it's going to suck. Oh, look, Roy McDonald's fighting Hector Lombard. Well, me, sideways. Oh, well. Uh, so, again. Don't worry, because uh, I hear they're about to sign Tank Abbott again. Oh, okay. They probably will. As soon as Bellator says they're interested in him, the UFC will sign him. Take it for what it's worth, everybody. All right, my plugs, I'll keep this brief. Uh, every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That might not be true um, in a little bit. I'll have more details on that as it uh, becomes more clear. Uh, but by and large, every Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern, I host the 411 Ground and Pound Radio Show. Uh, your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. This upcoming Sunday, we will be reviewing uh, UFC Fight Night McGregor versus Seaver and UFC on Fox, which takes place this Saturday, which I will also have coverage for. If you want to, if you want to follow along in the MMA Zone of 411 Mania, we'll also be previewing UFC 183, the return of Anderson Silva and uh, that guy he's going to crush, uh, Diaz, one of them, Nick. That's it. All right, so yeah, if you're a fan of MMA, give those a listen. Uh, a lot of fun over there. I haven't written anything uh, very much recently. I've just not had the energy or the impetus to really write anything about the world of MMA, but I'm actually going to turn that into a positive. And unless something big happens next week, I want to write something about dealing with the MMA malaise. Uh, so be on the lookout for that again. If any of that interests you, please... I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I believe the MMA malaise still has you in a chokehold of unconsciousness, does it not? I, I tapped out to the malaise. I, I don't blame you. Uh, I, I really don't. Um, keep checking out the Radlich and Broadcasting Network. Uh, we've got a bunch of stuff coming up, a lot of great on-demand shows. We've got a website coming up uh, in February. Right now we have the Facebook fan page, which I would encourage you all to like. It's Radlich and Broadcasting Network, R-A-D-U-L-I-C-H. Uh, to get all of the updates on guys coming into the website, all of our podcasts are mentioned on there, including this one. Schedules tend to come out through there. 
Uh, if you haven't yet listened to the last episode of The Long Road to Ruin, talking about the Lethal Weapon franchise, uh, do so. It's a lot of fun. Uh, one of my favorite franchises. Uh, partially because Mel Gibson using a triangle choke to overcome Gary Busey's face is always uh, a highlight. Uh, all right, that's going to wrap us up here. Uh, again, many thanks to Pat Mullen for joining me on this show. I imagine he'll be back in the future anytime one of these strikes is fancy. He's uh, not shy about being on, and I'm always happy to have him. Uh, he and I spent, have done a few of these before, and I again, I really enjoy having Pat on here. Uh, so, for Mr. Mullen, our resident pugilistic pontiff, I'm Robert Winfrey, reminding all of you, Christopher Lee is the man. And seriously, you got to have someone that you love to hate. Without a good villain, all of your heroes, they're just dudes. And some of them are douchebags if you don't have a great villain. Yeah, take that for what it's worth. Good night, everybody. I'll see you next week. So say good night to the bad guys.